This is a CJSR podcast. Volunteer powered. Listener supported. Campus and community. Radio. Podcast. Podcast. Radio. Radio and and podcast. podcast. Hi, my name is Kimberly, and you're listening to That's Food. That's Food is a podcast from CJSR, Edmonton's campus and community radio station. Handmade with love by University of Alberta students and community members. Telling the backstory to food in Edmonton, one meal at a time. This episode, I'm tackling some tough questions about Edmonton's favorite pastry. Where can you get the best cinnamon bun in town? What does the history of the cinnamon bun look like in Edmonton? What is behind the very real emotional connection many Edmontonians have with this pastry? And really though, what is everyone's deal with cinnamon buns? Let's start with a theoretically simpler question. What are they even called? On paper, it would appear from research that cinnamon bun is a uniquely Canadian name referring only to the uniced variety. In the USA, these naked ones are called sticky buns. In my research, I also found coffee scroll, cinnamon swirl, cinnamon danish, and cinnamon snail as regional names, all of which are cute but not used anywhere I've ever been. Wikipedia also posits that in Canada, they are known as cinnamon buns. They are usually self-glazed and not iced, nor do they usually have raisins. They can have so much cinnamon that they are spicy and hot to the taste. So in conclusion, cinnamon rolls are generally frosted and less traditional in Canada, while cinnamon buns are without frosting and are more traditional to Canada. And I agree, they shouldn't have raisins. Of course, that raises the whole argument about whether they are better with icing or not, or whether anyone actually follows this convention, or just kind of uses roll and bun interchangeably, or if this linguistic phenomenon is even worth spending any time in a podcast on. Right, let's go back to the very beginning. Every variety of the cinnamon tree is native to various South and East Asian countries. While five different species of cinnamon tree are used to produce cinnamon, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to focus on the two most common varieties. The Cinnamomum viram tree is native to India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka. In English, the name translates to true cinnamon. This true cinnamon is often called Ceylon cinnamon after the country the Europeans mostly got it from, because the British colonial government figured that Ceylon sounded close enough to Sri Lanka that nobody would care, and they named the crown colony that. Oh, Britain, you have made your main character syndrome. The species used to make cheaper, more intense cinnamon is from the Cinnamomum cassia, native to China. This is the kind of cinnamon most Americans and Canadians are familiar with, and it is called cassia cinnamon. And there are further sub-varieties of that based on where it was grown, since it's now commercially cultivated in several East Asian countries. To my understanding, the main difference that most consumers will notice between varieties is the intensity of the taste and the thickness and toughness of the bark if you bite in sticks. Let's talk about the history of cinnamon in the Western world, since the cinnamon roll originates in Europe. Cinnamon was a big deal for a long time. The Egyptians had it, and it was super expensive since it had to come from far away. It was not food, though. It was used in incense and for embalming mummies. In the Greek and Roman empires, it was still super valuable, used for incense and flavoring now. For a while, folks were also under the mistaken belief that it was grown in Arabia, gathered from cinnamon trees by giant cinnamon birds who made their nests out of the rolled up sticks. There's a whole part of that story where the harvesters had to lure the gigantic birds from their nests with equally gigantic hunks of meat that they hauled up the mountainside where the birds lived and then knocked down the nests while they were empty. But in fact, the cinnamon bird story was general belief into the 14th century. Although one of my favorite ancient people, the Roman Pliny the Elder, who wrote a fantastic encyclopedia and then died on a rescue mission at Mount Vesuvius, what a legend, he called the story out as a marketing ploy by the traders so they could charge more. Continuing into the Middle Ages, Europeans continued to be completely baffled by where cinnamon came from. For a long time, Italian traders held a monopoly on cinnamon distribution in Europe, since just about everything imported to Europe would pass through their ports. They generally kept the strictest secrecy on where their goods came from. 
if you remember junior high social studies in Alberta, you'll recall that those guys got absolutely loaded from their control of incoming goods from the east across the Mediterranean. Unfortunately, they also had a monopoly on importing plague-ridden rats, so they got the brunt of the plagues, too. Then came the point where other European powers started sending folks out to develop their own trade routes, because not only was the whole monopoly system complete baloney, but the Italians were getting increasingly occupied battling the plague rats. During this whole debacle, some other stuff happened like Europeans finding out about America, but we're focusing on the cinnamon. Starting in 1505, Portugal started colonizing the coastal areas of modern-day Sri Lanka to extract cinnamon and other spices for themselves instead. And also, that was just such a convenient time to try to convert the locals to Catholicism as a little side quest. The Dutch overtook them in 1658, and then in 1796, Encyclopedia.com gives the excellent verb ejected to describe what the English did with the Dutch. However, by that point, cinnamon was being cultivated in other places and was a much more affordable and generally accessible product like it is today. That entire time, the colonizing powers were motivated by the tasty and wonderful cinnamon produced there, and the profit that came from selling it abroad, and the subjugation of theoretically lesser people, and a general air of superiority supporting goals of European expansionism. Of course, they justified everything they did with racism and paternalism that continue to affect every part of the world today as many nations continue to struggle to transition into decolonialism. Can decolonization efforts even be considered effective yet when hegemonic whiteness means that proximity to European standards is still widely considered the ideal for nearly all aspects of society and culture today? Let's consider that Western European standards of beauty are so stringent and histories of using colonized regions for resource extraction are so pervasive that instead of nude, fair, natural, or neutral titles that make up and clothing that match lighter skin tones get, nudes for people with darker skin often have names like coffee, chocolate, caramel, or sometimes cinnamon. Now, I won't do a huge background around yeast-raised pastries. The long and short of it is that someone a few thousand years ago made dough and left it out too long and the natural yeast bacteria in the air started to feed on the sugars in the dough and farted out little bubbles that made the dough fluffy when baked. Over time, we got better at science and developed methods of processing yeast until Fleischmann's Yeast was founded in 1868, the first yeast company in North America. Modern cinnamon buns slash rolls allegedly came about in Sweden in the 1920s as a dessert meant to be eaten at fika, a coffee and dessert custom. They are called kanalbule, which translates very creatively to cinnamon buns. There, October 4th is National Cinnamon Bun Day. There is some argument around the origin story, though. Germans call their version a schnecken, which contains nuts and raisins, and the British also lay claim to a similar pastry with currants called the Chelsea bun. These can trace their roots back to the 18th century. Descendants of early Swedish immigrants to America also claim their ancestors to be early beholders of the cinnamon bun recipe, saying they brought it over with them in the 18th century when they immigrated. Because it's such a simple dessert, it's probably been invented a couple times in various formats, so tracing it back can be hard. But we know that by the early 20th century, cinnamon rolls were a well-known dessert to many English speakers. A version of cinnamon buns that I'm very familiar with, the Pillsbury cinnamon buns in the tube, were first sold in 1956. By that point, they were a pretty standard dessert for most of North America, featured frequently in cookbooks. Aside from the instant can variety, cinnamon buns were epitomized on the University of Alberta campus at some point after 1917, when we have the founding of the Tuck Shop. The Tuck Shop is where the Fine Arts Building on 112th Street is today, and they were the ones who made their formerly famous cinnamon buns every day for hunger university students. Also in my research, I found out they had a dance hall, and apparently there was a chicken coop inside at one point. After the tuck shop was torn down to make way for fab, the recipe got moved over to the cab cafeteria, where they made and sold about 70 dozen a day until food services were privatized on campus in 94. There's a whole great article that informed a lot of this story from 2019 on the New Trail website, which is the alumni magazine. The article is titled Cinnamon Buns, A Love Story, and was written by Curtis Gillespie, and goes into pretty incredible detail about the university's relationship with cinnamon buns. This brings us to another question. Where can you get the best cinnamon bun in Edmonton? One of the first things I learned through researching for this episode is that there are a lot of places to get cinnamon buns in Edmonton, and people have capital O opinions about them. For my purposes, I looked around on the internet, browsing a number of forums and rating aggregators for suggestions, and I asked friends for their opinions. I bought eight different buns from eight different places, baked a batch myself, gathered some information about each bun to share, and rated each one. 
And while doing my investigation, I had the opportunity to talk to a few cinnamon bun purveyors, who you'll hear from in a moment. The first place I went to was Malina Bakery. They are a Ukrainian bakery, but they had cinnamon rolls to try. And because I brought them home, I actually had my partner Jamie try them along with me. Hi, I'm Jamie, and I'll be taste testing some cinnamon buns today. These ones are from Molina Bakery on the southwest end, and uh, they actually have two different ones. They have a cinnamon twist, which is this beautiful one that looks a little bit like a really overbaked Pasca, and then they've got a uh, cinnamon bun, but it loses some points because it's frosted, but it is a pecan bourbon cinnamon bun. So we tried the twist first. And it really reminds me of, you know, when you're a kid and, and you've got those early morning classes to go to and your mom slaps together some toast with uh, brown sugar, butter, and cinnamon? Cinnamon toast, yeah. Yeah, cinnamon yeah. toast. It tastes like Cinnamon Toast Crunch, like the cereal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I thought it was a bit dry, but now that I'm getting into the center, it's, yeah. it's got a lot of moisture there. This has a crust on it, and it's not the best look for a cinnamon bun. The outside makes it a little bit dry for what we're looking for. Yeah, I'm going to start it off with a six, just because the presentation is so beautiful. I'm big on presentation, but texture is, like, what really gets me. So, yeah, six out of ten. Now let's try the roll. My first reaction looking at this, we cut it in half because we got one of each. There are a lot of really thin layers in this. Oh wow. That's up there. That's probably like a 9 out of 10. That's intense. I'm going to give it a 7. Again, texture. Softer than the twist for sure, but still very bready. Um, yeah, flavor is a little weird. Not what I was expecting. No, it's kind of... Um... Cinnamon is not the central uh, character here. The bourbon is very strong. It's walnut, right? Pecan not walnut. walnut. Just pecan bourbon, I mean. Oh. Molina Bakery. On average, you said 9 out of 10. Their roll gets uh, an average of 8 out of 10, and their twist gets a 6 out of 10. Not long after that, I was able to head down to High Level Diner and talk to a couple of the people there. Okay, so I am here with uh, some folks at the High Level Diner. Can you introduce yourselves? Yeah, I'm uh, Debbie uh, Parker, um, general manager and co-owner of the diner. I'm Adam Stoiko, uh, chef and co-owner of High Level Diner. The first question is a, is a pretty practical one. What makes cinnamon buns an attractive item for a uh, for a diner or cafe to be selling. They were one of the original menu items from back in 1982. So I think for us, it's sort of just been the carry on of tradition and being sort of like the original cinnamon bun. Now it's kind of a, a novelty, I think more, and it's, it's, uh, it's more popularized. That's always been like a classic diner cafe thing is baked goods go with coffee really well. So, why do you think people in Edmonton and uh, more broadly Alberta are so obsessed with cinnamon buns? I mean, again, I think going back to what Adam said, that it's sort of that like goes with coffee, like that pastry, that feel good kind of, everybody likes that sort of comfort food. So I think it's definitely would be the go-to and because we get what eight months of winter maybe that's sort yeah. of the, <laughs> the hype on it that you know you need that warm you up that carb comfort to uh, to get you through <laughs> so one of the things that we're looking at in this podcast yeah. what is your fondest cinnamon bun memory mine was it was uh my mom always involved me in every step of cooking usually you know getting to to punch out the dough um with her it'd always be this huge batch and the dough ball was as big as I was and then after it getting wrapped up just stealing the little bit of like raw dough and eating it <laughs> before they go in the oven. I would think actually from being here um, there was always times when we had sort of that leftover dough and there was times when I brought it home and my daughters would like go through the whole process and like we would make sort of mini cinnamon buns at home so I would say that would be my best nostalgia memory would be you know the girls sort of pushed up to the counter and like 
rolling out the dough <laughs> and getting messy and you know and baking together I think that's for sure a good memory that's awesome yeah. well thank you for uh participating I'm looking forward to trying it right on all right awesome. are you a corner person are you a middle person or what's I'm your I'm a middle person your, okay actually yeah <laughs> very good I'm with you on that <laughs> Back in my car. Okay, that cinnamon bun was definitely intended for two people to eat. Uh, that said, I ate the whole thing. It was really tasty. Uh, the sauce, absolutely drinkable. The frosting, I wasn't in love with. It was really tangy and kind of salty. The sauce is what puts it over the top. But because it's an additional add-on, it is an additional fee, I am going to rate this cinnamon bun just as it was. So it was really fluffy inside and then crunchy on top and then like caramelized on the bottom. It was very well balanced. It wasn't super bready like some of them. It was definitely more in line with a fluffy pastry. It's a nine out of 10. So I did stop by Sugar Bowl, cue the investigator music. <laughs> While nobody representing them was available for comment on the similarities between their cinnamon roll and high-level diners a couple doors down, I can say that the new trail article I cited earlier states that high-level diner had it first, and when Sugar Bowl was most recently rebranded, they modified the recipe a bit. According to local restaurateur rumor though, it's the same recipe. That however, is called gossip and conjecture. To the average person, which was me, they do seem pretty much identical though, both being twisted instead of rolled, but Sugar Bowl makes the point of offering to make theirs into French toast for you if you like. So because the cinnamon roll itself is so similar to high level diners, I've elected to give it a matching 9 out of 10. Next up, I met up with a friend and we went down to Bountiful Farmer's Market to try Farmhouse Bakery, and then we headed to Hazeldean Bakery in Hazeldean. They also have a Terwilliger Town location, oddly enough. So now we are at Bountiful Farmer's Market. It is a Friday afternoon, so probably the best day to come because it's all old people and <laughs> there aren't 3,000 children running around. Uh, but they were playing weird Russian folk music, so like, buyer beware. <laughs> I'm down for that though. All right, can you introduce yourself? I'm Kirsten. I am invited on this magical day and I've never been here, but it was fabulous. Very well um, curated, I've got to say. And I'm excited to try this huge cinnamon bun. Okay, when was the last time you <laughs> ate gluten? <laughs> July? <laughs> <laughs> so initial thoughts. It Hair's smells good. it smells like the, the cinnamon bun place at the mall. Yep. Which isn't on the list because I hate the mall. I got some crunchy sugar on mine. Mm. That was good. Mm -hmm. Soft. Very soft. This is fresh. This is like impressively fresh because I know they bring this stuff from like an hour and a half out of town. I hate to be biased, but like this is like one of the best baked goods I've had in months <laughs> because everything I have is like really dense. So like this is like phenomenal. chewy. <laughs> Nine out of ten. You know what? I'm gonna. I'm doing a ten. I just. I just had a gluten free I got pancake. The most biased person on the planet. I had a hard gluten free pancake yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first impressions of Hazeldean Bakery. The bakery itself is very small. Uh, smells incredible. Yes, agree. Um, there's nowhere to sit inside, so we are in my car right now. It's a little crowded. Looks a lot like you might find it in like Valair, Alberta. Yeah. Yeah, or any other generic small Alberta town. Yep. Smells like the the bakery in the IGA in Falaire. Oh Doesn't it? Yeah. With the long johns. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. You can buy them in six and she will encourage you to buy six. <laughs> but you can buy them in one. It comes in an entire bread bag. <laughs> mm. Oh my god. Really good. Okay. Really, really good. Okay. This one is my first ten. The best cinnamon <laughs> roll I've ever eaten in my life. It smells friendly, but also like they don't care about your health. The first one was made like organically with hand milled flour and they're proud of it. And I feel like this one is not. And they're also proud of that fact. 10 out of 10? Yeah. Oh, 11 yeah. out of 10. Yes. This might actually be the winner of this episode. <laughs> I still have to eat like five more cinnamon rolls though. 
The next place I went was Blue Plate Diner, where I got to interview one of the co-owners and try one of their cinnamon buns. My name's John Williams, and I'm the uh, co-owner and operator of the Blue Plate Diner. Thanks for coming on the uh, podcast. The first question that I'm asking people is, what makes cinnamon buns such an attractive item for a, for a diner or a bakery to be selling? They're decadent, but approachable. Like, they're not a um, honey, lavender, almond uh, croissant. You know, it's it, they have the same level of decadence as that, but they're a little more approachable, like a really good pancake. You know, um, everybody knows what they are. You know, what kind of know what to expect when you get it. And, you know, um, and it's... Uh, it's sort of a very, something you wouldn't normally make for yourself at home as well. That's probably the biggest one. Like who makes cinnamon buns at, who makes cinnamon buns at home that turn out really well? <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't. Why do you think people in, in Alberta, but especially Edmonton, really love cinnamon buns? Because there's the, the fact that a lot of places sell them, but the fact that they sell them is usually a response to so much demand. That's, that's, that's what exactly what it is. I, I, we can think of lots of other things that are decadent to make as well. So it's not the fact that we make them um, and people want them. It's the fact that people really want them and we make them. So it's sort of a chicken and an egg thing. So I'm not sure which came first. The, the demand um, was high or the fact that lots of people, lots of places make them and people started ordering them. A lot of what we're talking about in this episode is the nostalgia factor with the, with cinnamon buns. So I'm asking people, what are what is your earliest like memory of eating a cinnamon bun? Probably my my grandma's cinnamon bun. Hers were hers were a little different. Um, she would put cardamom, almost like almost like a chai spice in, in, in hers. I didn't realize it then, but I know now that it was like a little more of a peppery chai spice sort of a. Cinnamon bun. Maybe they shook up in Germany. Maybe it's a German influence. I don't really know. So, um, yeah, that's what I remember. And I remember them being really big, but they probably weren't because I was probably, you know, a little, little tiny six, six year old. I'm thinking they're like these huge things, you know. And, uh, and I remember we used to get so, we get so uh, messy with icing, like, like in, in my ears and up to my elbows. And my mom used to have to like kind of wash me all down, and uh, she used to make me eat with my shirts off because I got so, <laughs> I got so messy. So it should, it should be messy. If it's not messy, then it's not right. All right, mm-hmm. thanks a bunch again. Uh, let's try the cinnamon bun. <laughs> oh my god, why did I think this was a good idea? I am getting very sick of cinnamon rolls. That's it. Blue Plate Diner, great cinnamon buns comes with frosting. It was soft and fluffy, served warm and gooey. Had a great time. Trying to uh, keep it consistent even though I'm tired of them, so I'm gonna give it a nine. Not long after my trip to Blue Plate Diner, I actually went home and baked a pan of the Tuck Shop cinnamon rolls. So if you explore any U of A lore, you'll pretty quickly stumble onto the legendary tuck shop that I mentioned earlier, and no mention of the tuck shop goes without mention of their cinnamon buns. It was a defining feature. Even though you can't buy them anymore, Joyce Kerr, the legend behind the legend, shared the recipe in a home-sized batch of 18 buns in New Trail, the alumni magazine, in 1982. So the recipe itself has some obvious issues, namely the seasoning, which is remarked upon in the 2019 post I got it from. Uh, Basically, it's not enough. But besides that, the recipe actually made an incredibly fluffy dough, but as it stands, the recipe turns out pretty bland, So if you use that recipe, be smart and add like twice as much butter, sugar, and cinnamon as it calls for, and they're going to be delicious. Shortly after that, I brought home another set of cinnamon rolls from Square One Coffee. They have two locations now. The original is north of the Derrick Club where I went, and the new one is on Stony Plain Road in that new glass building, uh, Kitty Corner from Tasty Tomato. So I went on a day when they didn't have fresh cinnamon buns, actually, but they sold clearly labeled day-olds, which I figured be fine, and that is how I would describe these buns, is fine. The texture was obviously not as good as it could have been, and a little chewy from being out, but I feel like the flavor wouldn't have changed over that day, so I think I can accurately say these tasted like a cinnamon bun on the high end of mediocre. If you're going to be at this cafe anyway and you like cinnamon rolls, I'd say go for it, 
but they had cheesecakes in the fridge that I kind of wish I'd grab instead. We gave it a 6 out of 10, but they might be 7 out of 10s when they're not day old. The very last place I tried was Cineholic. I went to the one on White Ave, but I believe there's one downtown as well. It's a newer chain. Uh, it's in the U.S. West Coast, and then there's two in Edmonton, but they're expanding further into the Canadian market this year. They're actually the only cinnamon bun store I went to that isn't native to Edmonton. I had a very interesting cinnamon bun there. The plain part of the cinnamon bun actually has that kind of really intense almost alcoholic taste that sometimes cinnamon buns have, but their big thing is that their cinnamon buns can come with all kinds of crazy toppings. I had one with marshmallows and chocolate and something else that I don't recall on it. Uh, it was very, very sweet. It was very sugary. If you want something like very, very sweet, definitely go there. Um, but if you're looking for a more classic cinnamon bun experience, maybe try somewhere else. I would say I had a 6 out of 10 experience eating that cinnamon bun. So best overall goes to Hazel Dean Bakery. It was a soft, very rich pastry and me and my friend really enjoyed it. Best fancy one goes to Farmhouse Bakery in Bountiful Farmer's Market. It was very nice and fancy. It had a refined palette. The Modern Classic Award goes to both Sugar Bowl and High Level Diner because they are right near each other, easily accessible from campus, and they make big fluffy ones just like the tuck shop used to. Congratulations to all of our winners. You win a shout out on this podcast. Thank you to everyone who participated, whether you knew you did or not. As we've seen, Edmontonians in general are some of the most dedicated cinnamon bun fans out there, each with their own overlapping theories as to why they're so enamored with them. Remember Gillespie's New Trail article from before? He actually references U of A researcher Clayton Dixon in a discussion about this particular pastry's hold on us. Dixon establishes that because the olfactory bulb, the part of our nose that processes smells, is located so close to the memory centers of our brain, smell as a sense has one of the strongest memory connections, more so than sight, sound, touch, or taste, which have a longer way to travel before getting to get stashed in the long-term memory bank. Because the smell of cinnamon and yeast is so strong and so specific, the nostalgia created by smelling and tasting a cinnamon bun is so intense that it's this very enthralling emotional event. So not only is eating a cinnamon bun great in the moment, but that moment can continue to live on in your memory in a very emotional way. Cinnamon buns aren't perennially popular because they're cheap, pretty easy to make, and highly scalable, although they are those things too. Those are all contributing factors to most of us having memories of them in the first place. But cinnamon buns are popular with home bakers, restaurateurs, cafes, and bakeries today simply because they're cinnamon buns. And who doesn't have a great memory of eating a cinnamon bun? Snack fact! The word yeast originates from the Sanskrit word yasyati, which means to seethe or boil. Through this root word, it actually connects to the word eczema, referring to any kind of skin inflammation. Those of us with eczema will uh, understand the seething and boiling part. And those word etymologies are provided by the Oxford English Dictionary. And that's it for this episode of That's Food. Today's episode was produced by me, Kimberly Gorkachuk. Thanks to Debbie and Adam with the High Level Diner and John with Blue Plate Diner for speaking with us. Links to the article and recipe referenced in this episode can be found in the episode description. Our music is by Doug Hoyer, and you can find all of our episodes on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and on our website, thatsfood.transistor.fm. You can contact us at thatsfood at cjsr.com, and we are That's Food CJSR on Facebook and Instagram. That's Food is produced at CJSR in Edmonton, Alberta, on Treaty 6 territory. But is it food? That's, That's good! good.